too much LGBT crap. Game sucks. That's a strong statement there. Are we gonna back that up, Eddie? <sighs> it's woke as all gods are women. All the major faction leaders are women. I don't think they are. Off the top of my head, I can think of Zevlor, Hethric, Gortash. Maybe he's talking about, like, Orin? She's one of the most underwhelming bosses of the entire game. I'm pretty sure I killed her in, like, two minutes. I don't know. Maybe I'm just missing some context. Let's read the rest of his review. Everyone is gay. Everyone is bi. Everything is far left. Woke crap. Over it. Wish I never bought this game. <laughs> okay. 84 hours on records, by the way, fellas. I did not back this game all those years ago to have forced homosexuality trans LGBTQ plus whatever nonsense shoved in my face that trash has no place in gaming keep your devil perversion to yourself oh all right all right I think I'm getting it I think I'm getting it the issue is with devil worship and the thing is that makes sense right because when I play a game set in the fantasy world of D&D &D and all the lore contained within the last thing I want to see is the imagery of the devil because D&D &D was never about that okay I'm kidding <laughs> because whatever will I do it's not like D&D &D has not only one but two different types of demons within the lore itself. I don't know. These reviews are a little out there for me, but I do think this next person may have a point, although it seems like they enjoyed the game overall, so I'm a little confused on what their review is. They say, it's an amazing game, great graphics, the story and choices are so great. There is sex. <laughs> the fact that it gives you the option to play this game so many times in different ways is the best thing about it. I actually love the connection you develop with the characters. It's worth the money. <laughs> Negative review. <laughs> it could have just been a Stardew Valley mode. Agreed. All right, it seems like this guy may actually have a coherent point to make, so let's actually hear him out on it. Remember how you felt when Mass Effect 3 ended? The complete lack of payoff for absolutely everything you did? Well, apparently Larian took that as a guidebook and not a cautionary tale. Want to know the effects of all your actions on the planet? Too bad. Want to know what happened to all your companions you spent 100 plus hours getting to know? Too bad. Want a scene with your lover at the end of it all? Too bad. This guy actually makes a decent point. After 70 to 100 hours of deciding allegiances and which companions I want to invest in, I would have liked an ending that isn't entirely wrapped up in 10 minutes. It seems like after the final boss fight ended, it was just kind of a checklist of okay, now this companion says this, and now this companion says this, and they're on their way. Also would have liked to see more consequences for spoilers, embracing the lithid powers to the extent that we did. It really would have been nice to see some sort of indication of where the characters were going, or consequences we may face for the choices we made, other than the awkward Bethesda-style side quest NPC dialogue that we received. Shadowheart specifically had a very weak ending. Admittedly, I did miss a large portion of her side quest, but that doesn't change much, because when you search the alternate ending on YouTube, it's just the same thing with an extra bit of dialogue. Everyone is gay and wants to bone you. Combat is an RNG simulator. It's D&D, &D, bro. Racial diversity in every area makes absolutely no sense in a fantasy setting. This guy is calling for segregation in his video games. Maybe, maybe I'm misinterpreting that. Is, can somebody else follow up on the whole racial diversity thing? This guy says, not enough black people. Oh, oh, I completely misinterpreted it. He's saying there's not enough enough representation in the game. This is a long one. Could have been a great game, has good points such as great cinematic dialogue, animations, lip sync, etc. Large choice of classes and races for the player characters, different and imaginative ways of approaching combat encounters and other situations in the first half of the game. No day one DLC nonsense. This guy's actually giving the game some credit. Yeah, these points are true. These are the features that make Baldur's Gate 3 so good. Currently there are like three big RPGs on the market, Starfield being one of them which takes the age old Bethesda structure and puts in a space with a million loading screens. And on the other hand, we have Cyberpunk, which has actually been released for over two years now, but is now releasing trailers telling everyone that now is the time to be playing it. The game is fixed. And in a similar vein, Baldur's Gate 3 has also been available for years now, although it's been categorized as early access. And it's been the first game in forever that I've actually seen use this early access feature as a way to receive community feedback and develop a game that we want to play. Okay, we see that he's given the game its due credit, so let's hear him out on the negatives. Quality of the game drops in all areas, and the last third, especially the amount of bugs. Far too easy on the hardest difficulty, only died once in the entire last two thirds of the game, which was due to a bug on the final boss. Terribly designed encounters in Act 3, especially the boss fight spamming 50 enemies doesn't make the game hard, just makes the game a tedious log. This is especially a shame in the first half of the game as they've been really good. Overall, I do disagree with these points. I think there are parts of Act 3 that are somewhat not to the same standard as the first two acts, but it's also one of my favorite acts of the game, Act 2 being my least favorite. So I think these opinions are more subjective than anything. Naively thought I could ignore the romances as I do in every other RPG. The game, however, makes you endure flirting scenes from men, women, and even space squid monsters. One of the characters even had to go at me for not following any romance storyline. I can understand that complaint, but I also don't think it's that big of an issue that the characters want to fuck you. I don't know if that's a polarizing take, but it's not like consent isn't acknowledged in the game. It's as simple as saying, nah, I'm good, and you receive a, okay, whatever. Of course. 
terribly sorry. No sense of where you are in the world. There's no overall map like in the original Baldur's Gate, which makes the world feel small. This could have been my personal preference though. The main plot was okay, but it doesn't live up to the standards of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Main villains are nothing compared to Irenicus. Alright, I'll be straight up. I never played the first two Baldur's Gate, but from what I've seen of them, I don't really think this... is a standard we should be trying to live up to. Overall, I wouldn't recommend buying this game unless they seriously reworked Act 3, even though it's better than most of the slop that constitutes modern games. I'll just stick to the originals. So he thinks the final act is bad enough to constitute not buying the game. And to be honest, this is the issue with Baldur's Gate 3. Like, it's so good that any flaw will set off all the alarms that we've been conditioned to expect from all current AAA games. Ubisoft, EA, hell even Rockstar at this point has caused us to expect the worst and be happy when we receive a game that doesn't crash on launch. And Unlike many, I didn't follow the development of Baldur's Gate 3. I never even played a turn-based strategic game in this style before. So launching the game for the first time, I feel like I was met with the most complete and well-produced game that I could imagine. And it gave me a similar feeling to when I was 12 years old, firing up GTA 5 for the first time and waiting two hours for the installation disc just so I could play a world that would take me to another reality. Take me away from a hard day of 7th grade pre-calculus. And to be honest, I haven't had this feeling of wonder and amazement in over a decade. But playing Baldur's Gate 3 has been the closest I've came to it. And like I said, this is to his detriment because any shortcoming of the game seems like a direct insult. But when I notice these small issues, instead of being upset by it, I recognize that it comes from a place of me loving the game and not hating it. And do I wish Baldur's Gate 3 could have the same effect games 10 years ago had on me? Yes, of course I do. And that makes these perceived direct insults sting even worse. But I don't think that feeling of amazement will be replicated ever again, as I am now 22 years old. No game will ever likely have the same effect on me. But Baldur's Gate 3 is the closest I've come to feeling this way in a while. Negative five out of ten, British. <laughs>